It's a battle that Adamstown residents and Newcastle Council have been waging for almost two years. That's when the Defence Department first announced plans to rezone five hectares of land at its former rifle range at Adamstown for redevelopment. Last night, that wish was reluctantly granted by councillors. It puts us on behalf of the community in a difficult position, but we've got to make a decision. Council concedes the decision will come at a cost to local residents who are hoping the land would remain open space. But a crafty deal between the Defence Department and the Roads and Traffic Authority has forced a different outcome. In exchange for developing the West Charlestown bypass, the RTA has agreed to buy 25 hectares of compensatory habitat south of the Adamstown site for a mere $50,000. It will then be handed over to National Parks and Wildlife's Glenrock Reserve. Oh, it's better than nothing. Yeah, oh no, I, I fully agree with the 25 hectares, <coughs> but we had that before. Council is now hoping the five hectare parcel will be rezoned with a sufficient amount of open space. Now we've got to try and make sure that this land is not overdeveloped. Cessna Council set the wheels in motion 23 years ago, floating the idea of a heavy vehicle bypass around the town. Since then, financial problems have dogged the plan, the latest a cutback in federal funding. The federal government has cut $300 million out of New South Wales budget to look after the highway system. We're flat out trying to keep the system uh, going. But the federal government says the cuts were made well before the state promised the link road. Either way, Cessnock is the loser, with around 2,000 heavy vehicles still using Vincent Street every day. The heavy traffic that travels along the main street here in Cessnock is not only dangerous, but bad for business as well. Shopkeepers say it affects trading and also discourages tourists from stopping in the town. If you're serving a customer, you have to stop and you just can't hear yourself think virtually. Despite the weight of community opposition, the federal government is sticking to its guns, saying funding for the Link Road remains a state responsibility. Vanessa Spark, NBN News. Nearly a quarter of the young people in Cessnock are unemployed, a problem which has frustrated many for years. I was told by the officer in charge here that they're now down to the fourth generation of unemployed. But a new approach by the Police Citizens Youth Club may be a step in the right direction. Instead of offering just sporting activities, it's planning to provide job training. We're looking as a PCYC of introducing programs so we can help these unemployed to start on a program that they can start, oh well, works good, I can do this type of thing, maybe I can get out and have a look for a job. But the scheme will need money and the community funded group is struggling to find it. A meeting with the Minister for Juvenile Justice, Carmel Tebbett today, did little to bolster their hopes. I don't think the issues around funding, what I'll be talking about is the role that the PCYC can play and how you can get government agencies to work together more effectively. It concerns us. I mean, every, we're always looking for money because, I mean, we, we don't function without it. The Minister will travel to the North Coast tomorrow to meet with other youth groups. Vanessa Spark, NBN News. Half of the house is damaged total. The front portion of the house has been saved.
All members of the Somebody's Daughter Theatre Company have spent time in prison, mostly because of drug-related crime. They're taking their thoughts and experiences throughout New South Wales in their dramatic production titled Tell Her That I Love Her. The play is very real. There's a real authenticity. You've got real gut truth there. These women have been there. The script came from people who lived it. So there's an innuendo, there's a language, there's a dialogue, all of that, which is actual truth. Meantime, a new book has been launched in Lake Macquarie with the best short stories from the recent Roland Robinson Literary Prize. Titled Stories from a Lakeside City, the winning piece by David Kirkby reflects on life at the lake. Neat concentric halo rings, like ripples in a lake. Like the mullet jumping in Cockle Creek. Round wavelets spreading from a leap you never saw. A splash you barely heard. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Business people arriving for an Australian Business Council lunch at Newcastle Town Hall. Probably Peter Reith's most receptive cross-section of the electorate. But the minister charged with reforming the country's workplace had a different message today for all Australians. The no vote's the sensible vote tomorrow. The guest speaker went off to eat with the Hunter's business leaders, but not before some fair-minded advice on the referendum. If you've still got the Electoral Commission pamphlet, read it. Uh, because that does have all the arguments. Uh, you'll see in the yes case, pages and pages of blanks. And that's because they had a lot of trouble putting together the, uh, a substantive case to move to uh, the change on Saturday. If you read the number... On the 25th of last month, Rod Flannery, Ivan McFadden and Charles Morgan set sail from Newcastle Harbour in the yacht Gadget bound for New Zealand. 48 hours ago, Charles Morgan says they hit something in the sea and began taking water through the rudder shaft. When the weather turned nasty, the situation was out of control. The New Zealand Air Force answered the gadget's distress signal and found the yacht 600 kilometres west of the Cape Brianga, on the tip of the North Island. Uh, they had a, uh, a leak uh, through the rudder assembly of the yacht uh, that they had been bailing for some time and were virtually not keeping pace with the water that was coming in. The Panamanian trawler Sagami picked up the three men. They are likely to arrive at Littleton Harbour tomorrow afternoon. The gadget was floating when it was abandoned. At only 14 years old, Adam Feeney has won the right to play in the Pineapple Classic in Hawaii later this month. He already has a national title under his belt, but has set his sights even higher. National titles in Melbourne are won both leading and national event. And Gosford, it seems, is the place to be for young aces, with 20-year-old Paul McInerney already playing in the United States, leading the way for Adam to follow. You know, you really have to develop yourself at a young age, get as much international exposure as you can, and it will only hold you in good stead for later in life. It may be a few years yet before the two meet in the professional ranks, but for now Adam will take all the practice he can get. If I keep going, hopefully maybe pro one day. The Pineapple Classic starts on the 11th of November. Adam Harper, NBN News.
Brisbane Water is the second largest producer of Sydney rock oysters. And it showed today with the crowds turning out in their droves to sample the salty goods. Just people out and about and enjoying the opportunities that we have for our leisure time here in Wollaroy. And if the oysters weren't what people came for, there was the beer and wine or even the music. In fact, there was something for everyone, but the main attractions were the local crustaceans, which bring hundreds of tourists to the region each year. It's a big industry in a little area, really. Adam Harper, NBN News. The club held its first audition today in a bid to establish a 24-member cheer squad to entertain crowds at home matches and to represent the club at official functions. And what type of person makes a good cheerleader? Someone who has a lot of energy, who likes selling, a lot of enthusiasm, strong in their character. Um, we're not after attitudes and getting out there and displaying ourselves in front of people. It's definitely teamwork. I think it's just the prestige of saying you're a cheerleader because it's kind of every girl's dream. And I was with the Mariners, the Hunter Mariner Mermaids, and I just love being out on the field and seeing all the action and just performing for people who want to come and watch. Coach Lee Sterry will supervise a second audition next Saturday at the Broadmeadow Basketball Stadium from 11 o'clock. Car. Hurry up, going into turn three. Whoa, he got him again. Get on your feet and put your hands together. David Robertson wins the Hapsage. Oh, no, two cars, three cars, upside down. We got car. On Hart will not be denied. He takes the win despite a vigorous drive. From Troy Little in second, in third will go to Scotty Daly. It was an 18th birthday party that just got out of control. Partygoers started arriving at this Morgan Street home in Merriweather around 8 o'clock last night and they just kept coming. By 10.30 there were around 300 people cramming the streets and blocking traffic, outnumbering police 20 to 1. Today there was nobody at home. No evidence on the streets either, but ample anger from the neighbours. It was just horrifying. It was the scariest thing I've ever been through. They were rocking cars, they were jumping on cars as the cars were driving along the, the middle of the road. Two girls urinated in, the, in the, my driveway. Uh, a couple were fornicating in my neighbour's front yard. There was also concern about the lack of police at the scene. And we pay our rates to be protected and if that's sort of the, the protection we get, it's, no, it's not good enough. Every available police officer that could attend uh, from this LAC certainly did attend and uh, as I've said, they were supplemented by uh, police from Lake Macquarie LAC and Waratah. Five teenagers were arrested, two charged with stealing a motor vehicle, another for drink driving and two for failing to move on. Vanessa Spark, NBN News.
25-year-old Alex Wilson has known for less than two weeks that he was going to be the next Bronco forward. But already he's packing his bags and ready to leave his home in Curry Curry to have a go. I only get one chance at it, so I'm uh, going to give it all my best. Alex says that the selection comes as quite a shock, but playing professional football is a challenge he's ready for. I played with the Bulldogs there for a few years and um, got a few uh, rep selections. However, it was his state of origin reserves grade game that won selectors over, and now we'll see him put on the number four jersey for one of the strongest teams in the league. We well, uh, definitely think I can cut it, yeah, for sure. Although the Broncos started training today, Alex won't be joining them for another week. It's a five-month contract, which gives him time to prove that he too can run with the Broncos. Adam Harper, NBN News. While children played at Medford Primary School today, discussion erupted over the placement of a new tavern on this vacant block next door. Raymond Terrace-based developer Buildev has lodged plans for the hotel, specialty shops and mini storage sheds. But its location has some residents seeing red. I think the whole of Metford is trying to say that they don't want um, a licensed premises being next to their daycare centre and their public school. The developer says it's aware of the sensitive location. We acknowledge that it is close to the school. We're providing along the boundary with the school uh, a fairly substantial landscaping strip. In addition to that, a fairly high fence. The $1.6 million complex will create 25 jobs and parents of young children are being told it's a family-friendly tavern. Out of the 1,200 square metres in the tavern area, which makes up a significant component of the site, half of that's devoted to the family, and that includes child's play area, bistros, eating areas. There's only a very small part that you would say should be set aside for, for adult usage. The block of land sandwiched between the preschool and the primary school is zoned 3A which allows commercial developments. So it's now up to Maitland councillors to decide if the project will go ahead. Residents will hold a meeting at Medford Public School tomorrow night from 7 o'clock. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Going to a party used to require an invitation from the host, but these days, once it's on the net, it seems anyone can go. That's what the hosts of this out-of-control 18th birthday party in Newcastle found out over the weekend, when 300 people turned up. We weren't expecting it, that was the thing, that was the thing, man. Like we, we, it, all, it all came down to the internet, everyone saw it, everyone told another person, it kept on going and going, and then all of a sudden we got all these people out in our place, it was huge. Neighbours were terrorised and gardens trashed, a legacy of these types of parties which are a growing concern for police. Most of the, uh, the people that were there were uninvited and that they'd learned of it through the internet. Uh, I think that's not only a concern for uh, the police but certainly uh, citizens, as I've said, that uh, wish to hold uh, parties in their homes. The Department of Education admits it's tackling the problem by teaching young people how to use the net wisely. Schools are steering students away from chat rooms and programs which publicise parties like a popular site called ICQ. Schools are going about it so that we teach the students to be smart when they use the internet and to use the sites that are beneficial to them. The department says once students go home, it's up to the parents to steer them towards smart net use. Vanessa Spark, NBN News. The World Health Organisation says by next year depression will be the third most common chronic disorder to affect the world's population. But Hunter researchers are hoping to isolate behaviour in the brain that may lead to more effective treatments with less side effects. I think it's very important that in the future better medications for depression are found and this is uh, a beginning because uh, there is uh, uh, necessary for us to, to find out more about how they work in the human brain and at this stage little is known. 
A recent study has now led researchers to believe that brain cells known as tachykinins could well hold the key. Last year, a clinical trial in the US located properties in tachykinin cells later identified as a potentially effective antidepressant treatment. Local researchers are hoping their collaborative knowledge will build on that. It allows me to further expand my research experience by getting into the new um, and exciting field of the tachykinins, which Loris has a lot of experience in, and allowing me to apply the knowledge that I have of working in human brain tissue. The joint study between Newcastle's medical faculty and the Mater Hospital will commence in January. Helen Kapalos, MBN News. Volunteers of Newcastle's only radio station staffed by visually impaired people arrived this morning to find every door lock broken. Vandals had smashed their way in through the wall of an adjoining office, apparently searching for money. Just devastated, mate, to think that someone could do this to us. We've worked hard, we've got expenses to, to cover for building and everything, and this damage that's been done, it's going to be very, very hard for us to find the money to try and fix it all up. While the intruders did tamper with the broadcast equipment, they failed to put the station off the air. Makes me sick because we've got volunteers here, disabled people, trying to do something with their lives, and these buggers come along and say, you've got it, I want it, I'll take it. Meantime, a staff member at the mobile service station at Lambton was threatened by a teenager with a knife last night. The bandit made off with a small amount of cash. And two employees of a fast food shop at Glendale were robbed of the day's takings last night while attempting to deposit the cash into the St George night safe. A man distracted one of the women before grabbing the bag from the other. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Last month, a health review set up to gauge public opinion over changes to the Hunter Area Health Service put the closure of the Royal Newcastle Hospital on the table. Maintaining buildings that are deteriorating uh, is a very expensive business. But today, staff from the inner city hospital show they clearly disagreed. The proposition of closing the Royal is not a good one. The proposition that they should refurbish the Royal should be looked at. And if the view is that that's a polyclinic, that's unacceptable. Despite assurances from the Area Health Service that the deployment of services won't see job cuts, staff claim up to 105 full-time positions will go. They also have little faith in the proposal that a polyclinic will service the nearby community. It's clear now that we have to uh, get the community behind us. This is not just a union issue, this is a community issue. The union is planning to circulate a petition amongst the community this week. Helen Kapalos, MBN News. While the Breakers eventually lost to Marconi, their spirited fight back in the second half impressed many, including Coach Lee Sterry. He subsequently named an unchanged squad for this weekend's clash with the Melbourne Knights, a team at the bottom of the NSL ladder, 
but likely to be fired up after being humbled by top side South Melbourne last week. If you picked a team you didn't want to follow in the competition, it's always the Premiers or the Champions of the League because, you know, uh, they're going to touch up a few teams throughout the year and then you get the reaction the following week. One player who must think he's broken a mirror, though, is Luke Tomich. Kept out of the senior side by a virus last week, he went on to injure himself in the Colts team. He scored a penalty, uh, scored another goal that was disallowed and, and was on fire. Apparently played pretty well, but um, he strained medial ligaments in his knee, so he'll be out for a couple of weeks. Meanwhile, injured midfielder Greg Owens will have a bone scan on his knee since pulling up sore after resuming light training. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. A classic Honolulu Bay lineup for the final day of competition with Australia's Lane Beachley having to place first or second to claim another world title. Snapper Rock's Trudy Todd had other ideas carving her way across the bay to take the event. Brazil's Tia Tavares placed second. Beachley must now make the final of the Quicksilver Roxy at Sunset Beach in late November to win the title. Last year they let me run away with it but this year everyone's really hungry and everyone's really determined and they're not making it easy for me. And the Gold Coast Joel Parkinson is still celebrating after wrapping up the World Junior title at the same venue. From Australia, from Queensland, Joel Parkinson. Well, I just stuck to a game plan and paid off so I'm really happy. The surfer of few words blasted a near perfect 9.9. .9. Despite spending plenty of time on the inside, Hawaiian Bruce Irons finished second. Blake Doyle, NBN News. Donations for the people of East Timor have come flooding in since the appeal was launched. Organisers have been inundated with clothing, canned food, cooking utensils and even these cricket pads. All of it going to help ease the pain suffered by the East Timorese people. I'm very, very grateful and of course my, the people of East Timor and the people that are in need of all these goods are going to be very, 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 very thankful to all this support. Volunteers are now working around the clock, packing it all, ready to be shipped to East Timor. The wet season in East Timor starts, uh, I think, around December or so, so it'll be difficult to distribute the items in, so it's paramount that we do get it off in the next few weeks or so. One of the volunteers, John Santos, is still waiting to hear word from his relatives living in East Timor. He says information still has a hard time filtering through. As much as still to be done, rebuilding. It is, of course, it's still superficial things and, uh, and a lot of people are still displaced and, and uh, uh, a lot of them are coming back home and to what we all know that they're coming back for nothing. Tanya Carlisle, NBN News. The original Patterson Courthouse was built in 1858 and was used to administer justice till the late 1960s. These days it's a museum run by local historians who like to remember the good old days. Well, Patterson was the head of navigation on the Patterson River, so the, the steamships would come up here and um, bring up cargo and take cargo away. People would drive their pigs from the head of the river right down to Patterson, put them on the, on the boat and they'd go off to uh, Newcastle and to the bacon factory there. This weekend, the Society marks its 25-year anniversary with two open days. Among the history on display, the town's 1874 murder mystery where a headless body was discovered in Tokal Creek. And to that headless body was tied a large rock and um, it was brought in as evidence at the museum and it says something for the size of the rock, it's still here. So it's on display as well this weekend. Australian writer Dorothea McKellar lived in the area briefly and penned part of her famous poem, Sunburnt Country. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
Fire crews from across the coalfields raced to the 9th Street house, but fire had taken a firm hold. Fearing two people were inside, fireman Robert Lambkin was first into the burning house. On the arrival of the brigade here, the house was well involved with fire. We done a search and rescue and found that there's no persons in there. Uh, it seems to be a electrical fault. It's believed the fire started in a clothes dryer left on when the owner went to work. The fire service warns electrical appliances shouldn't be left on when the house is empty. Oh, oh for sure. You don't, you don't leave the house and leave a uh, clothes dryer or washing machine on, for, for sure. Meanwhile, it's thought a faulty toaster caused another house fire, this time at Belmont. Smoke billowed through the roof and flames leapt out the windows as neighbours tried to fight the fire with a garden hose. The rear section of the house was severely damaged but no one was injured. Blake Doyle, NBN News. At 11 o'clock, the gathering in Newcastle's Civic Park stopped to remember. By the time the armistice was signed 81 years ago, ending the First World War, 10,000 hunter men and women had served, more than 1,800 had lost their lives. The ending of the First World War was really a significant day back in those days, if you can imagine what the people went through in those days, the horrendous world, First World War, uh, it would have really been the, the greatest day of their lives to find out that that horror of horrors was over. Among those laying wreaths at the Cenotaph today was Lord Mayor John Tate. High school student Barbara Cameron represented a different generation, as did three-year-old Jack McKay Gray, wearing his great-grandfather's medals. Back in the days when there was uh, many, many thousands of World War I diggers here in Newcastle, they would all have been here. Um, Unfortunately they're not with us today. A lot of the people that are here, probably their fathers or grandfathers or maybe great-great-grandfathers were involved in the First World War. And it's important for those people to attend these services. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Thank you. 